Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Origin Story, where we dive into how your favorite YouTubers got started and where they are going. I'm Mike. And I'm JP. And today we are joined by George Poulos. George, thanks for having us. Th thanks for being here. <laughs> Hello, thanks everyone. For thanks for having me, y'all. Stoked to be here. I'm, I'm very excited for this. Uh, you have an amazing following and like great engagement on YouTube, which is something that we really look forward, as well as, you know, there's not many people that we've had come on the show who have a video from 14 years ago. So mm. there's a story within that alone that I think is going to be an interesting one to have. So for those who don't know George, George Poulos is a skateboarder living in New York City. His 510 videos have created a community of over 300,000 subscribers and have been watched over 41 million times. Check out his channel for trick tips, life hacks and just all around fun content including a full length skate video that him and his friends uh josh katz and you know jason park makes a uh an appearance in it which i was super stoked about watching that today um and his friends put together this year uh and so check that one out it'll be linked in the description below and uh you know outside of skateboarding george is a uh, you know and creating outside of skateboarding and creating videos george is an app creator and he's an avid chess player. He also is the owner and creator of Arrow Skate Company and the host of Dropping In Podcast. Tune in every Friday for a new video and check out the link below for some, you know, check out some Arrow Skate Company as you're wearing on your uh, lapel right there. Or not lapel, I don't know, bre breast. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, on his body, he's wearing Arrow Skate Co. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm really, really, really excited to have you on the show. Hell yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> let's start, you know, maybe back in New Jersey, um, where obviously skateboarding is a big thing to you. And so I know you started skating around eight years old. Can you tell us like how you found skateboarding? What was the draw to it? And what did you start with? 100%. So I started, that's right, it was in third grade. And I was simply drawn to these two fellas in my grade who I thought were super cool. They had long hair. Um, I just love their energy. Shout out Leo and Max. Um, and they skated together all the time. So one day I just decided to join them. They actually did. It's really cool. I, I haven't really heard of this anywhere else, but there was a skate program in our middle school gym, which I had no idea about. I was like, yo, that's so sick. Um, so I went there and that's really where I skated for the first time, like for real. I think maybe, maybe when I was even younger, I had dorked around on the Walmart board, but, um, with these two fellows is where I really started skateboarding and it, I really never stopped since that day. And it was just the fact that you wanted to hang out with two really cool long haired fellows that, you know, that was what drew you to skateboarding. That's how it began. You know, they, they were kind of like the rebellious type. I think they were in a band together too. Um, so I was drawn to that energy. And then once I started skateboarding, I fell in love with the uh, physicality of it. Um, seeing people do kickflips, I like, quickly became obsessed with wanting to do that myself. I, uh, I don't want to digress too far, but uh, recently in one of the videos about you hurting yourself and breaking your foot, you said maybe finally, this is going off of those two guys being in a band, but um, you know, maybe I'll finally learn how to play the guitar. I look over your shoulder here. There's a guitar. Did you finally, yeah. <clears throat> you know, learn how to play the guitar? And could you maybe go back and join their band? Yeah. So I don't know about joining the band quite yet, but you know, <laughs> we're we're already like coming to a lot of links because my first channel username was Skater Musicians. Um, not actually because of myself, but um, my parents wanted me to start the channel since I was so young as a joint channel with my sister who was a musician at the time. Um, so now it's like, now I'm actually embodying the skater musicians thing. So I've been playing for like uh, 10 weeks since I broke my foot and it's, it's been really fun. Oh, it's a great way to, uh, you know, use that time for a positive thing in your life. And I, maybe, maybe the name could come full circle and uh, change the self-titled channel back to skater musician. We don't know that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. That would be crazy. <laughs> Let's see. So what was the draw for, for you to stick with skateboarding? Because a lot of kids start skateboarding, you know, especially 13, 14, 10, 11, those kind of younger years where you might have some, you know, see it on X games or something like that. And, and then 
they, you know, other things happen, baseball, soccer, curling, depending on what country you're in, you know, whatever it is, or just not wanting to do anything. What kept you with skateboarding throughout this entire time? Yeah, that's a good question. No, I, I do generally get easily obsessed with things like the guitar is a more recent one. Chess is also fairly recent. I got obsessed with Rubik's cubes as a kid, like, um, but skateboarding is the one that has really, really, really stuck. Um, and I think just because it, it's, it's easy to get sucked into it, it's, it became addicting to me to learn new tricks. And I also think I got good at it, like kind of fast. And when you can start dropping in and doing ollies, like it becomes very, very fun. Um, I think most people quit before they learn the really fun tricks. And I think the really fun tricks are what are what makes it super, super addicting. So I powered through it. It took me six months to get my first Ollie and then another three months to get my first kickflip. I was just relentlessly obsessed with wanting to figure out those tricks. And once I had them, you know, it opened up a whole new world of tricks I could learn after that. Relatively quick for an eight-year-old though to get those tricks down, right? Like that's, you don't really see a lot of kids at that age with dexterity and ability to, you know, control a board like that. So that's pretty, that is very quick. It's also like, I feel like third grade is also like when you start to pick something up like that. And well, I mean, it's dual purpose too. It's like you're skating. It's also a locomotion. I think maybe when you first start, it's like, all right, it's a great way to get around to the friend's house, go to the park or whatever. And they're like, okay, now there's like, and let's fold in some more layers to it. Let's keep going. That's a classic, uh, you know, the, the addictive personality of like, I just want to keep getting better at something. Yeah. You, you keep going with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, and this kind of leads, I mean, like leading into this, I mean, going into like, I guess high school and stuff, you were also in a, a math and science league as well in high school. Tell us about yeah, that. Wow. How'd you guys find that? Oh man. Um, we dug deep. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, I was a serious, uh, I was a serious nerd, you know, like, just like how I got into, which I don't think is a bad thing at all, by the way, just like how I would get obsessed with various things as a kid. I, I also became obsessed with, you know, um, certain classes. Like I was really into math. Um, I started teaching myself coding in high school. Uh, yeah, I would, I would just get obsessed with things. And, you know, um, my parents also really, really pushed me to join clubs and, and things like that. So that was a part of it as well. Yeah, you definitely were in a, a, a lot of clubs. Um, <clears throat> two clubs that I think were interesting to me were art club. I look over the other shoulder from the guitar um, and there's, you know, uh, what are those? Not, oh my God, I'm having a total blank uh, paintbrush. Yes, that is it. Paintbrush below and, uh, and some painting. So are you, you were in the art club. Are you still into art today? I would say like, I think I'm an, art, I'm an artistic person, but I would say uh, I'm an artist in the way that I like create YouTube videos more. I do like to draw. Um, this right here is actually not a painting. It's a, it's a record cover. Okay. Okay. I, I, it looks like a painting with uh, paintbrushes next to it. So. Well, yeah. From my perspective, <laughs> could be, I don't know, but that's cool. Um, so the other club that I had a question about was the Millennium Club. What was that? And uh, can you kind of give us a little bit more information mm -hmm. about what that entailed? Yeah, so that one was, that was like my friends had started this club. And it was, it was, I believe it was about fundraising. Like we, we did various fundraising efforts. Like I, I think there was a bake sale and stuff. Um, full disclosure, that one was fully just to add another club <clears throat> to the resume. You know, hey man, you got it, got you, it got you into a really good oh, school. So, uh, you know, at, at the Millennium Club and fundraising <laughs> is a great thing to talk about in a college interview and things like that. So, so right. after you graduate college, you take your love for math and sciences and the programming club that you were a part of and teaching yourself programming. And you put that to full use at Wesleyan University, which in some of the videos that you are skating in, you are wearing a Wesleyan shirt. So I'm, uh, I'm glad that that still is repped throughout the, the channel. And you, um, you know, get a degree in computer science, but throughout the entire time, um, you're like doing side hustles of creating apps and 
coaching kids and teaching kids how to program. And so where did that passion for teaching and the work ethic through college? Cause most kids are not really that into working in college. seems like you did that pretty thoroughly throughout the whole time. Where'd that come from? Yeah. I, you know, I don't know what exactly put me on to teaching, but when, I mean, I used to want to work and like the only thing that I could think of was teaching. Um, and so, yeah, throughout college, I did like uh, TAing, like for computer science classes. I did just a separate tutoring job. Over the summers, I, I taught uh, at technology camps. I actually taught a, a YouTube production camp as well. Um, so I don't know, there, there's something about teaching that is really fulfilling to me. I think it's, uh, you know, I've always been really, really appreciative of the teachers that had an impact on my life. So I think that drew me to it uh, in a sense. And I, I also now see myself as a teacher still on my YouTube channel in a, in a little bit of a more indirect way about my life philosophies and, and even just skateboarding tricks. Yeah, that makes sense because some of the biggest videos that you have out there are trick tips or, you know, kind of the five simple ones out there. Not five simple. One of them is actually five hardest tricks, but um, right. so that, that makes sense. And so you you kind of start teaching, but what got you into programming itself? Yeah. Why was that a draw? Because there's a, there's a distinct difference between art and science. Yes. And programming, it's its own language and everything like that. Yeah, so I... What, so I, you know, I started getting into computers and technology in general, and I would say it was just another one of my kind of childhood obsessions. And, you know, linked to, to that whole technology obsession was uh, the YouTube channel I started back in the day and editing the videos on uh, Windows Movie Maker and then iMovie. And, you know, as um, as I got a little bit older towards junior senior year of high school I did start feeling a lot of pressure to look impressive for for colleges that was like serious pressure on my mind um and I think that programming was born out of that um and then I so then I just dove headfirst into it and I did genuinely get really into programming it just started with like YouTube tutorials and whatnot and um you know, taught myself a bunch of stuff, ended up making some apps even before college. Personally convinced that making apps and publishing them is is what really got me into that school. Um, that's my personal hypothesis. And then, you know, just continued it uh, in college by I went right for the computer science major. I have yeah. one more question about college and then JP, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll let you take I the next question there. But so all of the... Uh, all of the colleges in the world, right? You could go to, there's a hundred thousand colleges in California that have great weather all the time, great skate parks around them. You choose to go to college as a skateboarder in Connecticut, where you can't skate all year round. What is the, was skateboarding part of your decision or was it more so like, I want to go to the school because I want to join a, the workforce after this. I want to join, you know, I want to get a job at Google or something like that. Mm, that's a great question. So for one, for some reason, my heart has always been very tied to the East Coast. So I didn't even travel too far to uh, consider any other schools. Um, and to be honest, you know, I, I owe a lot of this energy to my parents. Like when I was a, C a junior in high school, I think that's when you're looking at schools. Like I really didn't care. Like I didn't know why college was important. It was not a priority for me. I just wanted to have fun. Um, but they took me on these tours, you know, and, and uh, something about this school just, just, it just felt right in my gut, like walking around, I just felt kind of like my home was there. Um, and that arbitrary reason is, is pretty much why I chose it. I, I mean, I, I can feel that testament very much for myself because I went on recruiting trips and traveled to a bunch of colleges and then all of a sudden I walked on the campus that I ended up going to and I walked on and I was like yeah this is pretty cool it, yeah. it was a little different I went to the pool and there's a bunch of girls tanning and I was outside in Florida and I was like yeah this is this definitely beats University of Delaware that's for sure um, <laughs> but uh, no that, that makes sense it, found, it seems like you follow your heart a lot 
and the passions that you have with inside and it's led you pretty uh pretty on a good pretty good path so far so i mean that's kind of my question it's like i mean maybe it's just because of how you grew up or you know your parents and like what path they took throughout life and just because people are taking a totally different um you know life route right now than ever before um the whole time that you were in college in the back of your mind were you thinking nah just i'm gonna skateboard and do youtube or were you actually or were you, like like mike was saying you kind of touched on it a bit the piggyback on it i mean you had to be thinking in the back of your mind like i just want to be skating yeah so i i so it's kind of this slow slow build and realization that happened in my life where at first in high school I thought that I was eventually going to have to quit skating to become an adult. Um, and then in college, I started realizing, you know, I, I don't think that's actually true. Like, I, I think I can keep skating and, you know, I could keep whatever, whatever makes me happy in my life. Um, but when I did start college, like, you know, there was no idea in my head that I could work from skateboarding. And, and that's largely why I committed to the computer science degree, because I was expecting uh, a more traditional corporate career. Yeah, that's I mean, that's kind of what I was thinking, because you kind of it's like you got to go in, you got to go. I feel like you had to go all in on one or the other. So what made you make that choice? You mean the choice of computer science? I, I mean, as far as like the, the fact that this is what you're doing you know, full-time versus being a programmer uh, at, a, at an organization. Well, yeah. So, so yeah, it was, um, it was a slow burn. Like I would say I, you know, I, I started really, really working on the channel and, um, and, and focusing more on skateboarding in during my freshman year, but there was no expectation of, of pivoting to that as my career that really only started hitting me like honestly when i hit a hundred thousand subscribers i was like oh oh right. shoot you know like i could do this and and that was in college right you were like you said you started the channel when you were a freshman in college and two two kind of questions is like you know th throughout college it must have been weird uploading videos to the internet when you're a college student because you know it's not as judgy as in high school, but like it, people are like, Oh, he's look at this guy uploading videos to YouTube. What was that like going through college and uploading skate videos? And then, you know, why, why did you decide I'm going to start? I'm going to, I guess, I guess the question goes back to when you were way younger, why did you want to start a YouTube channel so early on? Mm, yeah. So when I, when I really, really started my channel, which was, I think 2007, um, so I would be 10. Um, that was just because I thought it was cool um, and fun. It was another one of those things. You know, I got obsessed with things. Uh, YouTube became one of them. I loved browsing the website. I thought it was so cool. Um, and I thought making my own videos would be super fun and interesting. And I, and I, you know, I immediately went to filming myself skateboarding and I just loved seeing myself skate, interacting with people. You know, I watched Josh Katz videos at that time and he watched mine and it was like cool little community, like a bunch of people were doing it and it was super fun. It's, it's um, wild that now you guys are such good friends through this community of YouTube, right? Completely insane. Also, so, yeah, I, I mean, YouTube's, you YouTube started in 2005 and you joined in 2007. That's an early adopter. Early adopter. That's, yeah. that's an early. Yeah. So that that's super crazy. And <laughs> you know yeah but, and back then it was just i was just a kid you know nothing more than that just posting videos for fun yep and, and to the, for the whole world to see <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then so like what what was the thing in freshman year where where you're like okay you know at this point uh, i will say at this point you're still uploading videos to youtube before it's like even though you weren't taking it seriously and you were 10 and you were uploading videos you were still uploading videos I mean, if you look back, there's a video from 14 years ago on the beginning of your channel. I don't want to get too deep into YouTube because I think there's a couple of questions we have about like the past, but like, you know, but then there's a, a significant 
number of videos like nine years ago, which is way before yeah. college. So like, what was, what, what was the transition in college? Was it like, Hey, I'm going to be a little more serious about this YouTube thing. Or was it like, I'm still just, I'm going to go. Now I have, now I have a little bit older of a community. We're a little bit more mature. We're going to make some cool videos rather than just me. Like, I don't know if the flip camera or whatever you were using in uh, 2007 right. to do it. So, yeah. Okay. So a lot of components here. So yes, I did, you know, ever since I started the YouTube channel, I don't think I ever went a full year without posting at least one video. So it was always something I thought was fun and cool, even through high school. Um, I think what started to happen is I started to become self-conscious about it in high school, which, which seriously decreased the pace of how much I was posting. And I started focusing on, you know, the college applications because that was where I saw my life starting to go was this different direction. Um, what happened freshman year of college was I start like the, the realization that my life was going to go on this corporate adult mature path started really becoming a closer reality. So I was like, but I was like scared I was going to lose skateboarding and, you know, not have the time and energy for skateboarding. So I had this tool of YouTube in the back of my pocket already. So I was like, okay, I am going to uh, commit to an upload schedule to keep myself accountable to skateboarding. So it, it was a way to like kind of force myself to always skate so that I could produce a video. Um, and that gave me a lot of comfort because I was like, okay, no matter what path my life, my life takes me to, I'll, I'll always be filming skating and, and making these videos and doing this thing that brings me a lot of joy and fulfillment. That's a pretty mature way to look at it for a freshman in college where most kids would out be chasing parties on a Saturday night and doing those kind of things. And you're, I'm not saying you're, you probably were doing that too, but like, you know, but you were also like helping kids learn coding because you had passion for that. Keeping yourself accountable to a video upload schedule to continue to keep yourself passionate about skateboarding. And did you ever find yourself, because I feel like there's a burnout in, in YouTube and in most sports. And so you've gone so many years since eight years old skateboarding almost every day. Did you ever feel like you, the accountability got to like, be like, why do I have to do this? Is this really what I'm going to do? Or like, should I start to really focus on my classes and this YouTube thing's not taking off? Did you ever have those things of self-doubt? So it's actually, I've never even like realized this, but not once in my life have I felt burnt out from skateboarding itself. Um, when it comes to YouTube, uh, I've definitely experienced burnout, but not until it's been the full-time job. Right. And, and that's, that's a whole, and we'll talk a lot about like keeping up with the schedule the ideas. Cause it's a whole process that, that people don't realize. And I think that's one thing that we really want to dive into in these kind of podcasts is like, I want to set the right expectation for kids getting into this because they see people like you who are so successful with this have made it their full-time job and, and built a brand and, and, uh, and I, you know, are sharing their love and passion for something but they don't realize like it, you have to sacrifice things and you have to create yeah. these, these bonds and so i want to go back to one thing before um i let jp ask another question here and sorry jp but um i want to go back to high school because i think you said something about you know feeling self-conscious about uploading and I kind of was alluding to that from a college standpoint, because I feel like I would have felt self-conscious in college posting videos, especially even more so in high school, but my high school was very small. So like, what was it that made you feel self-conscious and how did you, how did you come up around that? Because I talked to a girl named Hapna from Iceland and she did the exact same thing during high school. She felt like she was a little bullied for it. So she didn't make any YouTube videos. And then after high school, she felt confident enough in herself to do this. And it, it feels like you fell, fell the same path. So where did you find the confidence and like, how can you kind of like, you know, inspire some people through that? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, in high school, um, I think just at that age in general, like you care so much about being cool. At least I did. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, 
And, you know, honestly, I can't even tell you for sure if I actually received any negative energy in person. Like, at the time, I perceived that I was, like, from maybe the older kids, the older skaters. But when I really look back and think about it, I think that I was creating the self-consciousness in my own head. Um, but, yeah, I was definitely very, like, I, I, I mean, it legitimately made me stop posting because I, I thought it was uncool. Um, what happened in college was I became old enough and, and a little bit more mature where I started to realize that uh, it doesn't really matter what, what another person thinks of me. Um, and so, you know, I started posting them just because I wanted to, and I was powering through some insecurity by posting that. And then I think what happened is by committing to the schedule and posting so much, literally the practice and repetition um, got me over the insecurity. And to this day, you know, it still can be a little bit intimidating, especially pulling the camera out in front of other people who I perceive yeah. as cool. Um, but it, but you know, with four or five years of relentless practice of doing that and, and putting it out there and, you know, just practicing it, it really starts to diminish the, the insecurity. And I'm right. sure you have. Keep, Go ahead, Jimmy. You keep doing it. It's like it becomes the norm. And then once you you feel comfortable and confident about it, then you can kind of wear it and it just exudes itself. I love that you got in front of your own. Um, <laughs> I love that you got in front of your own self for like posting like, I'm not going to do this because I just don't want to take the heat for it if I'm going to get any, even though you hadn't had any. I think that's, <laughs> it's kind of funny because that's just the way you are in high school. Like, all right, I'm just going to limit whatever, um, you know, I'm going to do some risk management on my end and make sure I don't get made fun of for putting this out there. Yeah, uh, man, I don't, I don't know what the deal is, but it's like, you know, that's a dude, middle school, high school. Those are tough, tough years, man. Yeah. You're uh, very malleable. Um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Well, I also like, um, what well, we noticed like you worked at Woodward as well. So 2017, yeah. you worked at Woodward, right? So um, were you ever like a camper or anything before that? How did you get that job? Like, tell us about that. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was a camper, I think two, maybe three summers, just a, a week or two at Woodward, uh, obviously at the time of my life. And then, you know, just kind of made sense to try to work there one summer after college. I think I've worked there two summers now. Um, and I, you know, I just applied online, actually. The first summer I applied, I didn't uh, get the job. Um, but then I, you know, the next summer I applied online, I got the job. I think I just worked for three weeks as a, just the skate park supervisor. That was it. And then the next summer I got to actually be a counselor and skate instructor. Definitely an amazing experience. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I mean, you're, put, you're putting the YouTube to work and it's like, um, had you already been doing at that point before then, had you had many like tutorials on like how to's and things like that on your channel? I think at that point, yeah. Like when I was working there both summers, like I was definitely like being approached constantly by the campers. Like, I mean, that that's literally my niche audience. Um, so yeah, the, ch the channel was definitely in full swing and making content at Woodward was great for my channel as well. Yeah. I mean, look at like, uh, I don't know if you follow Mount or sorry, BMX biking, but uh, like Spencer Forsman is a full-time employee of Woodward and he is always riding the parks, especially in the winter and stuff like that. Great content machine there. You have oh, yeah. every kind of thing to train on. And so did, did that improve your skateboarding significantly, either being a camper or a, uh, you know, a counselor? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I think just being there, if you're there and you're skating every day, you're going to get significantly better because um, it's just, it's, it's got the facilities you need to improve at skateboarding, simple as that. And it's got the energy and hype where you're going to push yourself. So I think it definitely improved my skating. Yeah. Nice to be in a facility like that, you know? Oh, yeah. It was I always know. my dream to go. I never went. I uh, I swam. So it was like the risk versus reward, get hurt, lose the season, don't go to college, be, or don't become a college athlete. So I was like, yeah. Yeah, they don't make, they don't make cool parks for, oh, they make a, you could go to a, um, you could have gone to like a, one of those water parks, though. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Like Camp Woodward would have been a water park. <laughs> we swim some laps and hit the wave pool. And now I've debated like, cause I live in Pennsylvania. So I'm like, Oh, should I go for like, uh, you know, like the three days that they offer for adults in like the fall. But then it goes back to the conversation we had before we started recording. Do I want to hurt myself yeah. in the age that I'm in and recover? So, um, 
no man uh <laughs> yeah so that's awesome I'm, I'm jealous i always had friends here in, in the valley who who went so yeah um so i mean just to i mean kind of jump into it too i mean just to address the shirt and i think we talked about it before the call or right when we were getting right in, right when we were getting into things but um you founded aero skate company so why'd you start the brand tell us about it yeah all right so this one comes down to my good friend brett conti um he he kind of became quickly became a mentor of mine because i had started my youtube channel um, he found my channel and reached out and like, I knew, I knew of him because he had a clothing brand called fortune New York. Um, and he reached out to me because he was going to start his own YouTube channel and he just wanted to skate, talk and, you know, talk about YouTube and hang out. Um, so, you know, through Brett, I learned, you know, he was seriously a, a real force for me in realizing that I could potentially maybe become a full-time YouTuber, um, you know, through various means. And I saw that he was doing it through his clothing brand. So uh, that was literally a direct inspiration for me to start Aero Skateco. Um, you know, since the day I met him, it, it was in the back of my mind about maybe starting a clothing brand. And, and then, you know, I don't know how many months later, but I just, I just kind of started it. Yeah. Did you guys feed off of each other. Like you're giving you're asking him questions about like starting the brand and what do I need to have? Do I need to incorporate all like those little things that you don't think about when starting a business that he's already gone through. And then were you giving him the advice of like, Hey, you know, here's some thumbnail things that I've learned. Here's some, you know, uploading things. Here's how to use the metadata tag and all those little things that you learn while building a YouTube channel. Was it like a good symbiotic relationship? I believe so. You know, he, so he is a lot older than me. I think about four, years older so he had this maturity and wisdom that I'm not sure I had like I didn't realize that I was sitting on something incredible on my I think at the time 10,000 subscriber YouTube channel um, but he saw it you know and that's why he, I think he I got on his radar I would like to think like hopefully I've helped him out significantly in these ways but you know he's seriously like I was shooting iPhone at the time and he's the one who taught me that you need to invest in your business in order to make it grow. I told him I was scared to buy my first camera and he was like, dude, it's going to pay off. You need to buy it. Um, and I, I've never forgotten that. Well, I will say it sounds like you have definitely helped him because he's well over 300,000 subscribers now too. So. Oh yeah. He's doing great. <laughs> yeah. So like, I feel like it, it, it worked out well for both of y'all. You guys still good friends now? Yeah, I was just over uh, at his office catching up. Yeah, we're friends. He's in New York. Yeah, dude, that's amazing. Um, I mean, I think like there's so much more to the brand itself that will that will uncover through the YouTube journey. Um, JP, do you have any uh, questions about how we got to YouTube? YouTube no, you know, I think it's I think it's interesting. Like you took you have such an uh, interesting path. Like we talked to so many people with different paths. I just feel like it's it's interesting with yours because of your like kind of specific set, like you went into college for computer science and most people would never stray away from like, all right, I got to, you know, I'm going to go get a programming degree or I'm going to become, you know, whatever. I'm going to be, you know, a software developer, a software engineer. Um, it's just, it's such an interesting path. And it almost, I mean, if you look at it logically, like if I were to, if you were to talk to my parents, I'm sure your parents are probably like, or maybe the, I don't know how, uh, you know, my parents are very focused in one set and they don't quite see, you know, maybe the, what, what the upside of another opportunity is where they'd be like, you'd have to be crazy to leave this, you know, programming world, computer science degree, all of this behind and just go, you're going to, you're going to skateboard all day and film, film yourself. Like, I just think it's like, <laughs> it's funny. Like I, I, I think there was a, there was a, it's a, there's, there's a, you know, it's like, uh, there's a, there's a path in the road and they're both like, I don't know. It, it, I just think it's a, a pretty wild. Um, not many people would have taken that risk, I guess. It was almost like a high risk, high reward situation. And you took the high risk and got the high reward, you know, right? So, yeah. Interest, yeah. interesting path. And I would say it's pretty unique where most people would have just shelved it and said, yeah, skate, but you know, I just skate on the side or whatever. But um, yeah, no, no, very interesting um, to get to kind of where we are today, which is kind of what, you know, we'll let Mike jump into here. Yeah. So, we're 510 videos later that and, and we've we've been burned by that number before because you know 
there is this amazing ability to make videos private, but we're we'll called 510 videos. There's probably more than 510 videos on the, on the channel. Yeah. Maybe, maybe some uh, young George drumming and playing some guitar with his sister. <laughs> we don't know. Um, 302,000 subscribers, 41.2 million views. You have six videos over 1 million views and three are also very close. Mm -hmm. So you earlier talked a little bit about hitting that, that, kind of first milestone of a hundred thousand subscribers can you kind of reflect back on when that was and what the feeling of hitting a hundred thousand subscribers was for you yeah well so i hit a hundred k funny enough on my birthday of senior year of college no way um, so it was a it was a big it was a big thing for me, you know, like I literally, I, th it, there's footage in my hundred K video of me crying when I, when I saw the thing. Um, and I think it's because that milestone, like literally has like cultural significance now, like a hundred K on YouTube is a serious deal. And it hit me when I hit that milestone that like, wow, like I've been working really hard at this and like, and somehow it feels like this has, I'm being rewarded for it. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I wasn't afraid to celebrate. I bought myself golden balloons and had a party. Dude, that's amazing. I mean, <laughs> you're hundred percent right. It is this milestone that everyone kind of looks up to. And what, what people don't realize is they start a channel, they start something and then they, they're like, Oh man, I got like 11 subscribers. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to stick with it. So you stuck with it for four years, you set that goal as a freshman. And then that milestone kind of going back to what JP said before, it's like, you know, it must have um, started to put some seeds in your head of like, okay, I hit a hundred K I'm about to graduate college. What am I starting to weigh? Like, okay, you know, I hit this milestone. What's next for me? You're looking at like, you know, if I went to this full time or if I went and worked nine to five, what, what are, what are you going to do? So like, how much did the timing of that affect the decision that happens next, which is the, full time. yeah, the timing was absolutely perfect. Like I, you know, I'm so glad it happened that way because uh, that really did give me a surge of confidence. And I was graduating literally one month later. Um, and, you know, my, you know, my channel's on an upswing. I, I, I think I like rocketed past 100K too. So I was like feeling so confident. Um, and, you know, before 100K, like end of junior year, beginning of senior year is when I really started having it in the back of my mind that maybe I don't need to get a job after college. You know, the, the AdSense was starting to look like, you know, potentially workable uh, to scrape by. Um, and then, you know, hitting that milestone, like, I think it literally sent me over the edge. And I was like, I can't, I can't get a job. Like, it's going to completely put this to a halt. Like, I have to, I have to just try it. How, so also going back to JP. Hold on, what did your parents think of this? First? I was just about to say that. Like, yeah, how do you explain Because that's, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, you had this high risk, high reward scenario, but nobody quite understands. Like, how do you explain that to your parents of being like, listen, there is a way, this is something I can do. So, you know, I, I, I became extremely confident and I think they saw that. And I was so confident about it to the point where there was literally nothing they could do. And I think like, um, you know, they, they also like, while they did really push me on a, on a particular more traditional financially safer trajectory, they did slowly start to understand what I was building. Um, and yeah, so by the time I graduated, you know, I, I have a hundred K YouTube channel and I'm pulling in some of my own money. Like there, there was nothing they could do really. Like there was no way they could stop me. So I think yeah. that made it easy for them to really throw their support at me. Yeah. And I guess like you did have the backup plan of having a very, uh, valuable degree, especially in the timing sense. Like, you know, we're, we're, I still think we're still in the infancy of coding and the, the language that's created and the opportunities that you can come up with that degree. Uh, I'm sure 
it's only helped you in all that you're doing right now, like creating a website for a brand, using, uh, you know, certain things to boost the algorithm to help you in, you know, understanding what an algorithm really is and the fundamentals behind it can't hurt. So, um, all right. So we talked a little bit about this too. 14 years posting to YouTube. You got to have some negativity. Obviously, we talked about, you know, times that you bought, you know, bounced off of posting, but not for too long because you always post at least once a year. But how do you always stay positive? Like, what's the what's the driving force behind it? Mm, well, I think I think, I've you know, today, as I'm talking to you guys, I've got a great system for staying positive. Whenever I see a negative comment, I uh, immediately shadow ban them. It's great for the mental health. Like I, do, I don't even let it penetrate my mind. <laughs> um, and now I, I even save positive and inspiring comments to my phone. And I try to put as much you know, positive feedback into my head as possible. And it, that genuinely, I believe, puts my head in a fantastic place uh, to continue this work and feel like it's meaningful. That that's a that's a first for us because i've never heard anyone say like oh let's, i'm gonna take this positive comment keep it and look at it because that's that's a, a great way to look at youtube because notoriously there's everyone thinks of the negative side but i would say looking through your comments today just re watching even the videos that are super you know up there five million views and things like that the majority of everything in there is positive but what sticks with us is that negative comment. And so how often are you reading the comments? How frequently are you engaging in the comments? How does the comment section work for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll pop on, uh, you know, the studio app, especially after posting a video and just see, you know, what's going on. Uh, definitely, I love to these days, after the video has been up for maybe a day, I'll go see what, what the top comments are and I'll definitely engage with all those. Um, and yeah, but you know, I'm not looking, I'm definitely looking through my Instagram DMs a lot. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm seeing constantly what, what, uh, what the feedback is for sure. Yeah. It's, it, you know, we always talk, I always kind of talk about this like a little bubble and that bubble is like, you know, if you're 300,000 subscribers, once you kind of break like maybe 400,000, 500,000 views, that's when people who don't know who you are come to your channel. And that's when they get a little bit more negative or weird or kind of stupid comments. But like oh, yeah. at the same time, they click the video. Like, I don't, you know, now you have this sounding board. I hope you felt great about that comment, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I've got a short that's taking off right now, a uh, YouTube short. And uh, so that when I'm on studio now, I'm seeing comments from like a viral hit and those comments are just ridiculous, but uh, you gotta, what I'd like to do is remind myself that these people, anyone posting a hate comment is probably in middle school. Definitely. And I actually weirdly enough watched that short like three days ago uh -huh. and didn't realize it was your short. <laughs> this is like, this two episodes in a row where I didn't realize that I was watching someone that I was going to be interviewing short or, or video content beforehand. And I watched that. And I was like, oh, that is a very, very weird and terrible design skate park. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you, the title, the thumbnail, everything nailed it there. But yeah, you know, 5.2 million views in uh, 60 days. You're definitely going to have someone who just is there to post because they feel cool about themselves. But at the same time, it might be their way and outlet of being bullied and they want to take out their anger online where there's no repercussion. So that's a great You're totally right. It probably is middle school and like high school kids. I feel like that's what all that stuff is online like. I don't know. Um, I think once you get older, you're just like, I don't have time. Like, I don't like, no, you don't I, have time to post the negativity. And it's like, you look at like Reddit and some of these places, or even like, I, I like, I, somebody posted like a meme the other day. I mean, if, if you see it a million times, but it's like a guy on his deathbed and he's like, I wish I would have spent more time arguing online. And it's like, it's one of my favorite things ever because it's such a waste of time. Like, even though like, I'll post a positive comment and then somebody else like commented, this was like today on a video. And somebody was like, agreed. And then the next person below them was like, why do you think anyone wants to read this comment? And I'm like, why would anyone want to read your comment? What are you doing here? What's going on in this world? The negativity seeps through. But yeah, you definitely just got to soar right over that thing. Like, yeah, you got to coast right over it. Yeah. Um, but now, um, I mean, you're also, you're, so you're making a, a full length video right now as well, right? 
Yeah, so we um, we re we released in March our uh, full length skate video, Every Meal's a Picnic, and you know we immediately started another one. So it's cool. Now we've got that was the first full length, and it seems like now we've got a potentially yearly pace of these full length skate videos. So that's a nice fun addition, and that that those videos leads to a lot of adventures, which is cool. Yeah, I was gonna say like, how much does that lead into? I mean, obviously it's great for content and everything too, but I mean, I mean, it's gotta, it's gotta boost your passion for the sport and like, you know, getting together with your buddies and creating a video. I mean, it kind of just creates a much more positive environment too going forward. Um, oh, it's, is, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Is that a recipe you guys are going to continue moving forward with? I hope so. You know, our, our pal Danny, unfortunately just moved to LA. So we'll see oh, yeah. how his uh, absence affects the squad, but um yeah, it's really beautiful. It's like a, it's a slower, longer term video and totally different vibe and completely different creative project. So it's, it's been a super fulfilling. Um, and, you know, it takes us on trips, which my YouTube videos really don't, which is cool. Yeah, I, I watched the full thing today. I, uh, I, I, don't, I had a, a lot of thoughts coming from it. Um, one of which it must be so cool. Cause I remember like growing up, I was skated a, a lot too with my friends and um after a long day of skating we'd always go back to one of our friend's houses whoever we were like where we were and we'd watch a video you know like the dc video or dark star video or whatever that person had in their collection or repertoire and now you're creating one of these pieces of history that kids could be like oh did you watch you know every meal is a picnic and the whole concept it's got to be a pretty great feeling to to hit that level it's a fantastic feeling and um you know for for this video you know it took us a year so we threw a premiere on our friend's rooftop and it was like you know it was mad beautiful like we got yeah. to bring the community together and have a little event and and celebrate our hard work so yeah that's been it's been really uh really cool to add that to the repertoire yeah josh josh uh josh was telling us about that when he was on the show and uh i and there's two things i really sorry jp but there's two things i really loved about this video is like I really like Josh's section header, like the intro to his section, because like throughout every person's section, you hear him yelling like, oh, F, yeah, like, oh, that's great. And then literally you guys replay like like a minute of those <laughs> comments of him before he starts. I thought that was so great and amazing. And it literally, it, it showed who he is as a person and the passion he has for skateboarding and filming. And then the other really cool one that I, I liked was like- And it's know, meta. Yeah, yeah. And like every, you had like this little section in the middle that there was just like, you know, one or two people doing tricks. And some of them were like crazy, like Johnny Geiger and Jason Park, obviously good friends of yours, I'm sure through the video and pulling them in. And when they come to New York, they skate with you guys. Um, and uh, I even like people, you know, there was people doing tricks that were not as amazing as you guys, but at the same time, you put it in there because that was the best that they did and they were passionate about the project and they were with you through some way of it. I thought that was really cool because you don't see that in the typical video. So hats off to you guys for keeping everyone in the loop there. Yeah, well, you know, our crew, we, you know, we like to push ourselves on the board, but I think as YouTube skaters, we're different from more traditional professional skaters in that we don't care as much about being good at the sport itself. For us, it's more about the vibes, uh, the progress, the just the whole experience, which I'm sure it is for pro skaters too, but um, our bar is not as high. And I think I certainly appreciate that. So I got a, I know I just told JP he can move, they get another no, question, but I, I was going to say that's here. No, and, uh, and well, this is a question we've asked every other skater who's come onto the podcast and i think it's not just skateboarding but it might just be because my perspective on here is growing up watching skateboarding there was this clear and distinct path to get sponsored right it was you followed the the you know you you went to the contest you got your name out there you went to new york or los angeles and you skated with a group and you know someone picked you up and they started to see something happen right I mean, a lot of kids through BAM in the Philadelphia area got that intro, but you had to meet someone who was professional to get onto a team. And it didn't mean you were the best skater. It just meant you knew how to influence and figure out the way through the path. Now, with YouTube 
and the ability to post yourself on the internet, this whole traditional route of kind of getting on the tour and getting a little part in a video and then becoming a pro and that whole traditional path has been disrupted. So what are your yes. thoughts on this disruption and where do you see the industry moving in the future? So, you know, I, uh, I, <laughs> like, yeah, I, I would never go the traditional path of skateboarding personally. It's too, uh, I just love, I, so I don't think that I'm a skateboarder. I'm not a professional skateboarder. I think I have what I have because of my videos. Mm -hmm. Um, I think skateboarding is a part of me and my channel is it's me. Um, so it's completely severed from the core skateboarding industry. Um, I wish them the best, but I think the traditional path is rapidly disintegrating. I mean, even today's traditional pros are essentially influencers. And I think that in the near future, there's not going to be a way around it. You're, you're going to need to have your own platform to be a successful uh, skateboarder or for that matter, anything or most yeah. things. Um, and yeah, so like my opinion is everyone can do whatever they want. I love the path that I've taken and I definitely encourage people to try this path. Um, and yeah, yeah. I don't know what else to say. It's a, no, it can't hurt. It's You're a right though. It's a, it's a, it's a part of the path that is now going to be, no matter what you do, even music, look at Justin Bieber started on YouTube, right? right. Like well, every industry is going to have this kind of set you have to have a little bit of volume you can't just be like oh i'm just gonna pop up out of nowhere at a skate park in tampa florida now i'm a pro right you gotta have you gotta have like instagram and those reels and all those kind of things that people are gonna want as a brand it's right. also very and, genuine as like a brand building your brand it's very genuine in like what you do it's like you know you're like hey this is just like this is me this is what i do and there's something to be said about the shift that's happening with kind of traditional routes versus building your brand and doing YouTube. If you pay attention to any sort of boxing or fighting, it's like, if you're an MMA fighter right now and you're getting in the ring and you're making $250,000 for doing an MMA fight, like sanctioned pay-per-view, and then you see a, a kid from TikTok and YouTube boxing for $5 million each, like you're going to be pissed. But guess what? Like they found their own route. They might not be professionals or anything, but they built their brand and now they have something behind it, a big audience behind it, a big audience that they can follow. And it's like, I mean, it's, it's kind of the route you're taking. It's like, listen, I'm not an X Games, but I've built my brand and I know what I am and it's genuine and people come here for that. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting pivot. Yeah. And you know, like um, skate brands, like no hate on them, but, but an observation, like I work with a lot of brands as a YouTuber mm -hmm. and skate brands are not, they do they do not want to work with me like i i have i've been paid by a single skate brand and it's car yuma and they're yeah. just they're a brand new skate shoe brand like no traditional skate brands have been open to paying me and i believe it's because they're still holding back against uh the 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 creator the creator marketplace the influencer economy you know well kind of fighting brands, against it yeah, car brands just broke this. I mean, this year, the first time they've ever used YouTube as the platform was this year. And if you noticed, like Ford, Tesla, all these major brands have now, instead of doing a traditional launch event, they've done their launch on YouTube. And instead of ousting people like Doug Demur Demuro made this point, he's like, look, um, you could go to autotrader.com or whatever you want, whatever source or magazine is out there. No one is reading that. I guarantee if you work with me, I'm going to get you 3 million views on the video of the car you're dropping. But yeah, it, you're not the first person who said that about skate brands. I just don't understand why they don't want to jump on the board of like, hey, this is the future of where we're going. But it opens the door for every person within this community to have that entrepreneurial opportunity to start their own brand and right. not have to work for someone else and all the work goes away right you've been it, it could be the catalyst that has pushed you to be on the entrepreneurial side because like maybe five years ago if you got sponsored by zero because you had great videos you might not have started aero skate company i think that's a great point and probably true yeah well we'll see i mean we'll, hopefully 
the world wakes up to this amazing opportunity. It, that it's nuts. Do. I feel like that's kind of like an old, that's like an old boys club kind of thing. It and it's like, I, it sounds much. very stupid and very like, if you're one of those brands and you're kind of like, you've been riding that coattail of that brand for 25 years and you're working there and you're in corporate, it's like, you need to make a shift because you're, you're going to, you're going to lose, you're going to lose some people. I think eventually, especially as like YouTubers start to, you know, push their own brands, for instance, um, there might be more people who are like, you know what, that's a little more like inclusive or whatever it might be. You know what I mean? I, I think they, man, they're missing a, a big market there, that, which is wild to me. Yeah. Wild yeah I think so too. Like, you know, they're, they're traditional and, and they're going to continue to attract the people who want it to stay traditional, which, you know, respect, I respect their decision, but I think I could sell a lot of boards, a lot of helmets, a lot of skate shoes, et cetera. Yeah, but you're just yeah. not you're not Pac Sun, so I just know. Well, I mean, right. even 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 you have it. You have a shoe review. You have a shoe review YouTube. You know, a video that's got like five hundred plus thousand views on it, and it's like, how quick? It's like, how do you not wise up to that? I don't know. It's. I think it's coming though. I think it's like it's a matter of time. It's adapt or die. So it, it's gonna it's gonna make its way. But I think you know you keep doing what you're doing. You're like, all right, well, I got my own brand, so uh, you know, yeah, it could be almost on your shoulders now to where you can start you know working with other YouTubers and things too. So. Or if not, awesome. like companies like Karyuma, they're the companies that are coming up in the current era in the skateboarding, made by skateboarders in this era, who probably watched everyone like you, like John, like Garrett Jenner, all of those guys. And are like, why would I need to go and uh, pay Thrasher three and a half million dollars to put an ad in their magazine when I can just, you know, get true reviews to the people who are going to buy my stuff? Right. Yeah. Great way to do it, but I think I, most let, people let's move on from branding. Uh, we will. Uh, slight rant though. Uh, most videos that we watched back in the day, uh, we all had to have the DVD in hand to watch them or yep. the VHS or whatever we needed to watch them. So things have shifted since those because those people are some of the people that are running the brands these days, anyway. So right. But but back to like so like for your videos too, like how do you kind of? I mean, I know you're you you know you try to do weekly, you know, a little bit of an injury right now. You're coming back from the injury. Um, yeah. But uh, you kind of do the weekly postings. Like, how do you come up with video ideas? And like, um, especially when you talk about some of these, you know, your, your full full length videos that you guys are doing, you know, how do you guys come up with those ideas? Is it on the fly? Is it something you guys are jotting down? You're just saying, hey, let's go to a location and figure it out. Well, you know, okay. So full length, first of all, easy. We're just skating. We're skating wherever the tide takes us. Uh, Bring the camera uh, going, roll. That's right. Going to Copenhagen in August, which is oh, very right. exciting. Yeah. Um, but now, okay. So in terms of my, with, of my YouTube videos, which I consider to actually be like my work, the yeah. full length is kind of more of a passion project, honestly. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to do one video per week. I, I love to be on a pace where at the beginning of the month, I choose the video ideas for the whole month. Um, Sometimes I'm not doing that and, and I'm just winging it and I don't like to do that. I got super anxious and stressed. Uh, right now, I've, you know, I've got all my ideas. I'm looking right at my calendar for June. Uh, it makes it nice and organized in terms of actually thinking of ideas. Sometimes they just pop into my head. Sometimes I'm watching content and they'll pop into my head because, you know, I'm inspired by something. Uh, sometimes I'll be brainstorming with Danny and we'll think of some cool video ideas. Uh, yeah, it'll, you know, the ideas come in a myriad of ways and I write everything down so I can consult it later and pick the best ones. Yeah, that's seems like a good thing. And then just go ahead for the viewers, just read off that whole list in June for us right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> oh, messing with you. There's I only four of them. We can't spoil your videos. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's funny though. Um, yeah. Cause I think, I mean, if it was, I guess, you, you know, you obviously take it serious. It is your full-time job. I just remember like being a kid BMXing or like what I would do now, like I have, I have car stuff and I'm like, I never really know what I'm going to do. And then I end up not doing anything. So it's always, it's always interesting to see how people are kind of, you know, organizing their, their YouTube strategy, whether it's a monthly or quarterly or yearly perspective or seasonally for you perhaps. So, right. And do you have like a differentiation that you want to have like a mix of video types or is it like really just, Hey, I've, I've got my four videos and, and it, yeah. So let's, the first question is like, is it a mix? Is it like, or is it just like, these are the videos that I have? Yeah. So I'll, I'll go through phases with this. Um, I've been in a phase where I'll try to do one 
what I would call like an algorithm, like an algorithm pleaser video per month, yeah. which would be, for example, my five trick series, which always seem to hit a hundred K. Um, and then, you know, and then the other three, I'll just kind of do whatever I'm feeling. Uh, right now I'm just uh, doing whatever I'm feeling for all four videos. Uh, and, and so like when you're saying, you know, coming up with these four ideas, so you have four weeks, right? Is it like, Hey, it's Monday. I'm releasing on Friday. I'm going to go. Here's the idea of the week. I know kind of what the thumbnail and the title are kind of going to be ish, but it might change. And do you go film that video and then edit that video, then release on Friday. And then same thing in the next week, the next week, the next week. Or is it like, I'm going to take this week and I'm going to film all four videos. Then I'm going to kind of edit the first one for here, then edit a little bit and upload two then take a week to brainstorm and think and relax. And how, how does that work? Or is it a mix? So I want to say it, it does ebb and flow and change, but generally speaking, I will um, spend Monday, I'll spend one week filming one video and I'll, I'll film one video each week. And then typically it will be edited and posted the following week. Um, so it kind of keeps that cascading flow going. Uh, so right now I've actually already got videos filmed for Friday the 18th and Friday the 25th, which is nice. Um, and so this week, I'm actually a little bit ahead right now. So this week I'm going to film a video and it will go up the following Friday. Um, and I love having that buffer because then I can take a break if I want to take a week off. Um, uh, I've right now I'm actually hiring an editor for some of the videos, which allows me to get ahead, which is freaking incredible. Uh, but historically I have edited most of my videos and that will usually take like several days. Yeah. Well, well let's, well, we wanted, we just had, um, we just had someone on, on our last podcast. We were talking about this exact same thing. Um, it was Brian and we we're talking, you know, he's a mountain biker, but he was talking about getting an editor. Um, if it, I know because what you do is kind of personal, like it's almost personal to you because how you shoot it and what goes on. So how it's got to be a little bit stressful to like relinquish that, even though you're like, oh, it's going to take it off my plate at the same time, it might take a little more time up front just to get that editor up to speed. So how did you pick the right person to do it? Or have you done that yet? Yeah. So I've, uh, I've tried probably three or four editors who just flat out, I just knew it wasn't going to work once I saw their first draft um <laughs> sorry guys then, it just happens yeah yeah you know it's like it for for me at least, yeah it is very particular because of my personality and like i obviously i could train these people but uh the skating like there there needs to be a good knowledge of skating because i can't like right. micromanage every single skating edit so um finally found somebody who actually had, I believe, seen some of my videos in the past. So there was already a nice foundation. Um, actually, Josh Katz put us in touch. I believe he used to edit for Josh. Um, oh, so he has the base of skateboard editing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so we, you know, we got off to a great start. Like there is a lot that goes into every video of communicating my vision. And I guess I would call it like creative directing the, the edit. Yeah. Um, and there's round, there's rounds of feedback, but, you know, thankfully I've found somebody who, who kind of gets my vision and even has some like finesse that I don't, that I'm not capable of, which I really appreciate. Yeah. That's the hard part is like, you need to understand kind of the brand and what I shoot and how I look at it through my lens. But then it's like, all right, can you also pop into after effects and throw a couple of graphics or 3d or do motion tracking or something like that on it to like make a slicker, you know, more edited clean cut production at the end of it yeah that makes yeah. sense i mean it, the, all the little things that you did in every meal is a picnic those little motion graphics are are things that were huge and, and they they actually reminded me a lot of like day one song and chris haslam kind of esque videos and those are what make it felt they made it, those little things made it feel different than a, just a standard youtube video though yes i agree the little things all definitely add up yeah uh we should talk about let's talk about that old broken wing you got there yeah uh i mean we've seen foot. the video you broke the foot yes you, you did a couple of tricks after you did a couple of repeats after it probably not the smartest in hindsight um <laughs> yeah. looking back um <laughs> how, long, how, long ago, how long ago did you actually break it 
Uh, I believe now we're at around 10 or 11 weeks. 10 or 11 weeks. So you're, you're almost, you're almost getting back. How are you feeling right now? Where, where are you at? Oh, I'm feeling great. I, I feel like I'm just hitting the point where I don't even feel it when I'm walking. Um, oh, nice. skating is not a hundred percent, but it's, uh, it's plenty to film videos, which I'm, I'm stoked about. Um, yeah, that's kind of like, that's what I'm wondering is. So now that you're going to get back to skating, obviously you're going to, you know, ease into it slowly, be smart about it. Right. You don't want to reactivate any in injuries, but what are you, uh, what are you looking forward to shooting first when you, when you get back, are you going to say, Hey, this is what it's like to skate with a broken foot or is it like, uh, what, what are you looking at? Well, it, so I definitely love sprinkling my wisdom that I'm picking up through life and all of my, all of my vlogs. So there's already been tidbits of things that I'm learning and observing. And um, I did one video just sharing how I stayed positive through the injury. Um, I think in my most recent video, I think was my first session at a skate park. And I talked about how I'm taking it slow, you know, appreciating all the little things about skating that I can experience again. So I, I'm going to be, you know, sprinkling in all, all the things that I'm learning. And, uh, you know, people are constantly being injured in skateboarding and I'm seeing comments. People are very appreciative of, of this insight that I'm sharing. So I plan to continue that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it was cool to kind of like tell the story arc of, uh, of the injury, not just on YouTube, but on, on like all the other platforms too. Yeah. It was interesting though, you know, like you, it, it, it affects your, your life. And there's a lot of changes from the videos that you posted exactly what you said, like a lot of reflection, a lot of, uh, kind of empathy through the comments because everyone's had injuries. One thing that I saw that changed from the most recent video was you had like a reflection period, you know, after you skated, is that something that's going to become a consistent part? Because I actually, I actually kind of really enjoyed like hearing your thoughts of the session, how it went, the motivations that are going to keep you going and like looking forward to what's coming through that session itself. Not a lot of people do that. It's a good differentiator. Yeah. I mean, so like kind of opening a can of worms here, like I, I love skateboarding, but I don't think it, I don't, I don't know, maybe it defines my channel right now, but I don't want it to necessarily define my content. Um, what really gets me going about making my videos is just sharing uh, my life and my insights and, and reflecting kind of what you just mentioned. Um, and so for me, it's, uh, I love skateboarding, don't get me wrong. And I, I love uh, including, you know, some, some aesthetically pleasing clips of me skating and showing the progress and things like that. But for me, what really gets me going is, you know, these more abstract things like the journey that skating is taking me on the experiences it allows me to access. Um, and so, yeah. And, and the, the, the broken foot has kind of opened my eyes to the, just the fragility of the body and the fact that having my content be dependent on skateboarding is a pretty risky place to be. Yeah. And it's not, it's not even what really, really gets me going. So, you know, I, I am intentionally trying to uh, just be more myself on my channel. I've started a second channel that I'm slacking on, but that's got completely non-skate topics. Um, I do plan to keep the main channel tied to skateboarding because I think that uh, people like to see me skate. Or do they like to see, because we, we just, we were talking about Brian before and he opened our eyes uh, we released the episode on Saturday, but we re recorded on Thursday. And he was like, people aren't there for skateboard. I mean, they are there for skateboard, but they're really there for you. Why does it matter to have two channels? Why not just say, Hey, I'm going to do my yeah. one skateboard video a week, but I'm also going to do a, a different video. Cause you're already filming them. Why not just keep the brand all the same once a week, I'm going to put up a chess video or once a week, I'm going to talk about, meditation and what's important to me in the future the, you know why why have two channels that's a great question and i've gone through like serious back and forth on this i think that um and maybe this maybe i think maybe my calculation is mostly like uh, a business calculation i think that keeping my main channel 
focused on skateboarding is going to be the best thing for that channel in terms of click through rate, keeping the algorithmic performance up, things like that. Starting a second channel allows me to diversify as opposed to keep all my eggs in the main channel where putting videos that there's no denying that some people are finding these five tricks videos and they want to see skateboarding. Posting videos that have nothing to do with skateboarding have a potential to drag down my click through rate, hurt my channel as a whole. Um, and I believe I've experienced that. Like I've, I've dabbled and it's not good. <laughs> yeah. So don't upset so, the beast, right? That's right. So my plan is lure people in with skateboarding with this, with the beast that I have here, um, introduce them to myself and hopefully tie them into my entire business as a creator. Yeah. A lot of, you're very analytical and there's a lot of risk mitigation going on um yeah, overall sure. but i think like i mean like the chess stuff things like that i mean i think people will be i get what you're saying um we, we do see like depending on who we interview it's like it's it's one or the other it's like yeah it's it's a weird take that that most people have and it might be different i think it's just because you're very analytical and you're very much like you know you you obviously put a lot of thought into what you do um so that, i mean it makes sense um but i think like you know people are there for you eventually like you are the brand we talked about it and they're going to watch, you know, whatever you're doing because they're interested in you. Not so it's not always about skating, right? Sometimes they might not even be watching. They might just be listening. That's right. Yeah. You know, who knows? Like, may, you know, maybe, maybe I'll try like something totally different on the main channel just to see. <laughs> <laughs> you just get into, just get into something weird. You know what I mean? Like what's, what's something like totally rad, like uh, going to the orchestra with George. Yeah, right. No, I think, uh, yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, no, it's just, it's just you playing a, acoustic guitar and skateboarding, just ASMR. <laughs> That'd be great. Well, you are you guys to... familiar? Are either of you familiar with Loff, Andrew Hales? Uh -uh. I don't think so. So he had a very niche prank channel and now he posts like totally. Niche prank channel sounds scary, but go ahead. Yeah. And Did now you say prank? niche... pranks. Yes. Pranks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And now he totally does like the most low effort vlogs I've ever seen on YouTube. But I love, they're literally my favorite videos on YouTube and I found him from the pranks. And now I just watch these low effort vlogs and I think they're super fun to watch. So that's actually super inspiring for me. Are they, yeah, are they really low effort or is he portraying low effort? I think they're literally low effort. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think it's funny, like every once in a while, like you have to, the way we describe, I mean, we have talked about too, it's like every single YouTuber, you're going to have a couple of videos that like pop well outside of your channel, like whether it's timing or the algorithms just right or whatever it might be that where all the stars align and it blows up immediately. Um, you get all of this cross pollination from other viewers and channels that all of a sudden come back to you. So it's like, if you can get them kind of glued in, you know, you can kind of get your hooks in early with that person. Um, or that viewer and be able to, to bring them on board. And that's like what you're just talking about right now, how you kind of got, now you're like watching low effort vlogs, but you're like, I kind of like, I like this guy. Right. Seems really right. Good, so seems yeah. like there could be an opportunity for the second channel to be some low effort vlogging from yeah. George, you know, we'll see. Yeah, maybe I'll have to try one. It, it I, sounds fun, honestly. I, I, I think I have to go, I'm going to look him up after this and watch it in bed. Um, my final question before I kind of roll, roll towards the Instagram side is like, we talked a lot about the helmet gang on our pre-call and uh, the movement behind that. And, and I'm sorry, it took me so long to get here, but um, I think it really is a super positive movement. And throughout the channel, there has been sometimes, uh, according to you, I haven't seen it yet, but where you didn't wear a helmet and now it's all about the helmet and wearing that safety net around your head. So why, you know, we've talked a lot about like adversity and getting through bullying. And that's definitely something which is so stupid in the community of skateboarding and action sports in general to be like, yeah, it's stupid to wear this life-saving cool. device, right? Like cool. you don't go, you don't go, you don't see like wakeboarders being like, nah, man, I'm not going to wear a, like a, a life jacket. That's stupid. Like, no, they do do that though. They yeah, do so, that too. Yeah. So it, 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 can you explain to me like how you came about the, the helmet gang and why you're creating this movement of positive? Well, obviously we know why it's positivity, but why, why'd you come up with the movement itself? Yeah. So it, um, you know, so I was not wearing my helmet when I started college. So there's, there's a bunch of videos where I wasn't wearing it. 
And then I hit a point where I decided I, I, this realization flooded in. I was like, I was like, Whoa, I've, I've always wanted to wear this thing. And the only reason I'm not doing it is because of, uh, uh, pressure. Um, and so I started wearing my helmet slowly and slowly. I started encouraging people to wear the helmet, just talking about why I decided to wear the helmet. Um, a lot of it centers around just making your own decisions in life. Um, I think the helmet gang is a, an acute representation of kind of a lot of the things we've touched on. Like when, when I was self-conscious about the YouTube videos, just kind of owning yourself, you know, and, and, and realizing that it's just fine to be who you want to be. And like, the, what other people think it might not even exist like just just be you relentlessly so I think the helmet gang is one way that I'm able to spread that broader philosophy um, and I like to think that one it encourages kids to be like oh I think I actually do want to wear a helmet hopefully saving some lives or injuries um, and two I hope that the broader ph philosophical message of, of just being yourself and and confidently going out into the world as yourself, I hope, you know, inspires my viewers in some deeper, in some deeper ways, you know? Yeah. I, I, I like that movement behind it of like, be yourself. Don't let anyone else pressure you. But I also think there's a huge movement behind it. That should be like, it is a life-saving device. Like, I mean, I, I do you know Scotty Kramer, another uh, fellow New Jersey native. Um, yeah. Look, he wore a helmet and he still like was paralyzed from a, a bike riding injury. And, you know, it is not worth anything in your life to not just wear a helmet to feel cool because you're much cooler alive than you are not. I mean, I completely even, a agree. even a concussion can be a life changing thing. I mean, like I remember I, I got a just the one time I just went, you know, snowboarding with my my buddies up at Mount Hood and we were just like, oh, it's going to be an easy day. We're going to, you know, we're not doing anything crazy. The parks aren't big or anything. So I just didn't wear a helmet. And we were all just goofing around, flying down the hill and caught an edge and got a terrible concussion. It's like those things can change you from a personality perspective, like just one concussion. So super important to wear. But then like, I mean, also like, I think once you get older, like you're obviously, I mean, you're a little bit younger than I am, but um, like once you get older, like even more so comes this whole, it, I wouldn't say it's an attitude as much as it is just like a mindset of being like, you know what, like just be yourself man. do what you want to do. Like you don't need once you start to not feel that outside pressure or like pressure from like social settings and things like that, you're like, no, I don't care. I don't care if I look stupid. Like I'll, I'll do whatever I can. Like I got a great life ahead of me. I don't, I don't want to waste it by just trying to be cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's so I, weird I, that we didn't get that when we were younger, you know, cause none of us wore helmets ever when we were kids ever. Yeah. And I think how you just described it is like one of the keys to a fulfilling life. Um, so that's why it's so important to me. Yeah. And I, I love that it's the positivity behind it too. It's not just like wear the helmet. It's the it's the movement of be your own person. Oh, okay. Yeah, Keep I like that a lot. Safe. And and I love that you're like this positive influence on social media who's showing them to do it. Like it's not like you're like, oh, wear my helmet. And then in your skate part, like half of it is like you're not wearing your helmet. But in your YouTube videos, you're always wearing it. It's like you're always wearing it because you believe in what's behind it. So right. All right, guys. So we're back and um, we're going to ask some of the questions from Instagram. So we posted this this morning and uh, I say this literally every week. I'm like, I'm going to do it on Sunday. And I didn't. And uh, I posted it this morning. Over a hundred comments, like a lot. I'm so sorry if I can't ask your question. I'm so sorry if I incorrectly pronounce your name, but I'm reading Instagram comments on the fly and your name. And I'm so sorry it's not against you at all, but um, we'll ask uh, three questions here. So uh, let's start with. Um, Lots to choose from. Yeah. I, I, a lot of these questions have been answered in the, uh, the kind of podcast itself so far. So I'm going to ask one from Nick Dorr underscore. What's your favorite New York City skate park? Hmm. 
Um, I feel like some viewers of my channel may know the answer to this, and I would say it's Cooper Skate Park. It's a nice mile bike ride away, really good, fun quarter pipes, and I love to go early in the morning. I'm actually going there at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Should be fun. And that's where you just uh, filmed your newest video, right? That's oh. right. Yeah, that, that looks like a really fun skate park. And, it's and great. a mile on a city bike, that's a different mile, though. I mean, that's yeah, well, I usually take the electric one. Okay, okay. But they're, they're notoriously not the most well-kept bikes. Definitely true. <laughs> um, so, a New York, I, mom. yeah, man, New York is a, a, a different beast in itself. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to say Ollie Dubs. We answered the question about you know the positivity. I think you throughout this you understand what we're talking about. Um, a lot of questions, you know, from like Tyler Williams nine one nine and uh, Alex Powers five one two seven. I'll put your guys' names like down here somewhere. They both kind of ask about like any tips for young skaters. Mm. I would say my number one tip, um, and you know, it's coming from a place of where I was when I was a young skater is I thought I had to, uh, you know, learn certain tricks to be cool, reach a certain level to be respected. I would say, you know, when you go out and skate, like, if you're being respectful of people's space and, and taking your turn, like own the fact of your current skill level. Like if you're a beginner, just freaking be a beginner and, and own it. You know, you have every right to be out at the skate park at the skate spot, like take, you know, take your turn. It's your space when it's yours and, you know, have a good time. Don't worry so much about uh, being the best. That's great. That's great. Uh, just advice for any sport that you're doing too, you know? You know, surfing. Just take that with golf. I take that with golf a lot. You know, it's like such a hard sport, and there's so much to it. It's like you know, you just you just got to go out there and don't be the guy hitting the clubs on the ground. Don't be the frustrated guy. Like, don't let frustration take over. Just be like, hey, this is my skill level. This is where I'm playing at. This is fine. This is fine. yeah. I went to the gym for the first time in my life recently. Actually, when I when my foot was broken and. <laughs> So I had to kind of go through that again. Like I was very intimidated, but I think you yeah. just got to show up and do your thing. I can't, oh, I can only imagine. Yeah. That's gotta be such an interesting experience. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, it, that's, that's the exact place where it's like, you know, I think you learn this as you get older, but when you're younger, you make a lot of mistakes. You're like, I'm going to start putting up weight and I'm going to start doing this quick. Cause I don't want to, it's like, I go to the gym now and I'm like, I'll lift away. I don't, I don't care who's there. I'll lift what I does. It. I'm going to, if I'm going to put, 225s on the end of a bench press just so I can like you know do what I need to do to to get exercise I'm gonna do it and I don't care if anyone sees it or how they you know how they look at me for that it's like yeah it'll pass yeah exactly a lot of times we're more self-conscious about what's going on in other people's minds when actually they're not thinking that you know what I mean that's right everyone's focused on themselves for the most part yeah. exactly but they're thinking this don't show up to those gyms that are like uh oh man what's the there's one in like in, in in Ohio where it's like a super power lifter gym and they're like, I don't know, they're just all beefcakes. It's exactly what you expect from this kind of concept of a gym. And I don't think they take too kindly to like anyone like us who comes in and they're like, yeah, I'm going to put two 25s on like 25s. We don't have those. No, 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 no. <laughs> that would be a good bit. I would, I would take that and it's like, yeah, guys, I'm just like, you guys mind if I just skip rope in here for like an hour? <laughs> Yeah, I bet they'd be stoked. They'd be nice. They'd probably be nice. I bet. I'm sure they'd probably they'd be nicer be, than you think. Sure yeah, you're always worried about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm giving terrible advice. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I so, like it. Yeah, but you know what? You're 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 100 right. Like every one of those people is probably so genuinely amazing people, and they're there completing their goals and their life life, and they'd probably be like, "Oh, why are you here?" And you're like, "Because I want to get fit. I want to get in shape." And like, "Oh man, like we're 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 here to help. Like we're here to yeah. need any advice. Like you know what?" man shame on me i'm sorry you're right you changed my mind right away um you know what <laughs> the beauty is is if you are doing whether you're skating or golfing or in a gym that's out of your league um like more people than not are, are gonna want to be helping you rather than yeah. not and if it's somebody who is not gonna want to help you and they're negative like here's the beauty of it life is full of choices you don't have to have that you don't have to have those people in your life so absolutely just, move on. beautiful advice Final, final question that I'm going to have is uh, from Offbeat Look. Uh, 
I'm hoping I'm saying, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's my uh, friend. Oh, all right. <laughs> so um, wait, which friend? Are we gonna... uh, her name Camille. She she actually has a YouTube channel as well. Oh okay. no way! We'll, we'll check her yeah. out, Camille. Um, she asked, "What's your least favorite part about your job?" Maybe she's asking for her future as well. Uh, so I would say I'm actually coming out of a bit of a, a rut where I was like feeling a little burnt out and repetitive and um, wasn't sure what, you know, what the meaning was. And so that, that was a rough, a rough little dip. And, you know, I was kind of going through the motions, but, but feeling just a little lost and confused. And I think as a self-employed person with no structure, uh, it can, you know, you can slip into that once in a while. Um, so being in those lows is probably my least favorite part. Although I am, you know, I've, I've pulled myself out of it. Like one thing is looking at all those positive comments, um, took the monthly planning more, more seriously because at that time I was, I was winging it every week. Um, so, you know, uh, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's something I don't like about the job, but it, it's also a, a challenge that when I, when I do see the other side, I, I, I do come to appreciate. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's exactly, you have, you have the right mentality to go about it. And I love that you screenshot the positive comments. Cause that's gotta be like, you're like, man, I don't want to make this video today. I don't want to, I don't want to go to the skate park at nine. You're like, then you open up your phone and it might be on your pictures or something like that. And you're like, Oh man, you know, John Jones over here is like, man, you like made my day. And you're like, man, I gotta, I gotta do it for him. You know? Yeah, exactly. Seriously. So, no, that, I, I mean, I have a little that's one nice. and every day I'm like, Oh man, I don't want to wake up. He's up at like 5. AM. I don't want to wake up right now. And then I walk in the room and he's like, so stoked. And I'm like, yeah, he's like, how can I not want to, deal with this so i can imagine it's that positive energy that you're getting from everyone in your community and uh you have an amazing community like very 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 good well-built community it's something you should be super proud of because everyone in this community is commenting great things they're in they're they're learning which is something i think that we learn from your passion early on is like teaching and bringing in all the positives of people out you're doing an amazing job of it so keep that up man you're you're inspiring us to keep going and you made this week extremely enjoyable for us to start off so i appreciate you very much george oh, i appreciate that a lot yeah this has been an amazing conversation seriously no it's fun uh, i i sure. look forward to it every week but like man this one this one was great i i really uh really can't thank you enough and so jp you want to roll us out yeah, let's do it. Uh, the, the high, the high risk, high reward man himself. I love it. Um, non-traditional path, but everyone's got their own journeys. Um, so yeah, no, thank you very much for being here. Um, it's so interesting to think that you could be sitting in a cubicle coding or well, I guess you'd be working from home right now, but you could just be coding <laughs> right. every single day. Right. Nonstop. Um, it's just wild to think about that juxtaposition of where your life could be. It's very interesting that you took this route and there's a lot of people that are happy you are. So we're, we're excited to see, you know, what you have coming up for the future. It's like you, you've got a lot of different things going on. You got, um, you know, I, I think ultimately we want to know is, you know, tell, tell the people here, um, where, which channels they should follow, where they can find you. You know, we'll have your, um, we'll have your brand linked as well, but, um, yeah, tell us, tell us where to follow you. Um, and what you got coming up and what we can look forward to from uh, George Poulos going forward. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I'm in a nice, nice energized upswing right now. I'm putting a lot of passion into my main channel, George Poulos. Uh, you can find skateboarding and just my philosophies of life, hanging out, doing some experimenting over on George Poulos too. Uh, <laughs> you know, chess, meditation, maybe some book reviews. Uh, yeah. We'll see. So trying things out on there. And I got all the social medias, Instagram, TikTok, over at George Poulos, Twitter. Um, my podcast has been on hold since the pandemic, and it's kind of still on hold. Maybe one day we'll get back on the dropping in podcasts. And uh, my brand is Arrow Skate Co. Summer line coming soon. And I think that's everything I need to plug. <laughs> well, I, I hope that's we're, I'm excited to for the podcast to come back. It's, uh, it's, it's another thing that you could put on your calendar um which is a great way to keep yourself you know in mind i love that so right, yeah. thanks 
Thanks so much for coming on the show today. I will 100%, you'll see me wearing an arrow uh, shirt in the summer line. I mean, I'll check it out tonight and see where we're at. But uh, yeah, man, thanks so much. This has been an awesome conversation. And I really hope that anyone listening to this point, you're motivated and realize that you can do anything and that you should follow what you think is the right path, just like George did and how he will motivate you. And check out his videos, like, come on. It's not going to hurt you. Even if you don't skate, it'll help you. So thanks, man. I appreciate it. George, thank you. Appreciate it, man. Hell yeah. It's been a pleasure.